Martin Reher, welcome to CM. Thank you. Thank you for having accepted this interview. How do you feel about being here at CM? What do you think about this place? What is the importance of this type of centers for mathematicians? Um, well, I, I like France. I like the south of France, uh, even if the weather is not as nice this week as last week. And I think it's, it's very important for mathematicians to have these kind of research centers. So there are a few of them in Europe. There's a film here, there's Oberwolfach in Germany, for example, um, where people can, mathematicians from all over the world can meet and they can discuss uh, in a sort of rela open, relaxed atmosphere and sort of nice surroundings and, uh, you know, with good um, infrastructure we have. You know, nice blackboards and so on. Um, yeah, so there were... So I don't know actually the history of SILM. So I don't know when SILM was, uh, was created or what prompted it. So I, th I think in 1981. Europe... 1981. Okay, so it's quite recent actually, yeah. Yeah, so I think the first one of these was probably Oberwolfach in Europe because that was created after World War II. Uh, in order to bring the sort of French and German order. mathematicians together. Mm -hmm. And it's, it worked extremely well. So, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's really, it's really crucial for mathematics to have these kind of places where you can meet and okay. you can discuss. Thank you. Because, I mean, you can, of course, nowadays you can, you know, you, you have Skype and so you can call people with Skype and you can discuss over Skype, but it's, it's still, it's not the same thing, right? I mean, uh, so if you call somebody over Skype, you would somehow set aside one hour or something, and then you have an hour, and then you have something else to do. Whereas if you go to a place, then, well, you know, you're there for the whole day, and you're forced to be there. Uh, and so then you can have a much, much longer interactions, and you have much more time. What made you choose math? We know, we know your father is a mathematician. That was perhaps affected your choice? Um, probably, yeah. I mean, so I, I always liked science in general. So when I was a kid, I was always interested not just in math, but also in physics and computer science. Um, so then I came to math maybe a little bit randomly uh, later on. I mean, I started studying physics actually at university. But then I, I was drawn to math. I never I never really liked the experimental, doing the experiments. Um, so this was not something I was very good at. <laughs> and so I was always more interested in the theory. And then what I liked about mathematics is that it has this more eternal quality. Right? So if you prove something in mathematics, then it's true forever. Whereas if you just come up with some hand-waving argument about something, well, if your intuition is good enough, it has a chance of being correct, but then you know, sometimes you might get it wrong. So, I mean, mathematics is unique in the sense that you can, uh, you can really discover eternal truths that just stay, are true and simply would stay so forever. I think that's one of the things that attracted me. Uh, and do you remember what was your first encounter with math? Um, so I remember, for example, when I was a, uh, at some point when I was maybe, I don't know, 10, 12, something like this, a teenager, um, we went on a hike with my father. And so he told me about the four color theorem. So the four color theorem, it says if you take uh, any map of the world, so you have sort of different countries with borders between the countries, then it's always possible to color it with four colors in such a way that across a border, you always have two different colors on either side of the border. Um, and it's, it's very simple to understand the statement. And if you think a bit about it a little bit and you try to somehow come up with examples and you know, try to find counterexamples, you can, more or less usually you can convince yourself after about an hour or so that it's true. And I was, I mean, I, I was shocked by the fact that then you know, you can convince yourself that it's true, but it, it ends up being very difficult to explain why it really is true. 
Um, and it took people a very, very long time to actually prove this theorem. So it was only proven, in the end, the proof came up only relatively recently in the second half of 20th century. Uh, but the question came up much, much earlier. And so I was uh, quite impressed that you would have such a seemingly quite simple question where you, know, you could understand the question, you can even understand why it should be true at some kind of intuitive level. Uh, but it turns out to be extremely difficult to you know, really put in words why it really is true, actually. Uh, let's talk about your research. Which areas of mathematics do you focus on? Um, so, well, my area of mathematics is uh, stochastic partial differential equations. So it's an interface between probability theory, which is some other mathematics of randomness, of random events, um, and a theory of partial differential equations, which is a theory of uh, describing the evolution of systems that also depends on, on the spatial component. So, for example, a typical example of something which is described by a partial differential equation would be uh, a fluid. Right? So, for example, I don't know, the wind flow in the engine of a plane, so that would be something which is described by a partial differential equation. And then stochastic partial differential equations are partial differential equations, but that also include some random, some randomness or some random component. Could you describe or remember your first Eureka moment? Um, well, so that was actually after, somehow a couple of years after my PhD, so there was so I was given basically a problem for, for my PhD by my supervisor. And I didn't quite manage to actually solve the problem during my PhD. So I made some partial progress, but I didn't completely solve the problem. And it turned out that there were several groups in the world that were working on exactly the same problem. And so then a bit later, we I met with uh, one of the people who were working on that same problem, we decided to put our efforts together and sort of start working on this together. Um, and we had a one ingredient, so we had a partial ingredient, but we didn't know yet how to really use this ingredient in order to solve the problem. And I was going to a conference in order to actually meet up with, well, so there was a conference, I was going to give a talk at the conference, but he was also going to be there. and we, plan to work together on this problem. And on the train uh, to the conference, which was in Italy, I remember I was basically looking out of the window and somehow thinking about that problem. And at some point, I, I just knew how to use that ingredient that we had in order to really solve the problem. And so I scribbled on a piece of paper just to make sure that it actually works to work out a couple of details. Um, and then I just, you know, I told, so Shumei, my wife, she was also traveling with me. And so I told her, oh, I think I just solved the problem. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, it's not possible, it doesn't make sense. You just didn't do anything. You scribbled for two minutes on a piece of paper. And now you're telling me you solved that problem that you were thinking about for 10 years or five years or so. And, uh, but yeah, so then of course it still took maybe one year or so to or half a year to work out all the details, but it was, uh, it was solved. <laughs> uh, you are one uh, of the four Fields medalists from 2014. Could you talk about the results for which you received this prestigious prize? Um, well, so what I did was to, to build a theory that allows to, to give a notion of solution for a large class of these stochastic partial differential equations. So there were, so what happened, the situation was that there are a number of these equations that you could, formally you can somehow write down the equation, but then there are terms in the equation which one doesn't know how to interpret. So the problem is not so much to solve the equation or to show that the equation has a solution is actually the question of what does the equation even mean? Right? To sort of have an interpretation, a sort of coherent interpretation of the equation. Um, and of course, the interpretation should also be consistent with you know, physical reality. I mean, so these equations, they model uh, real phenomena. 
Um, and so they can be, they are supposed to model situations that you can simulate in a computer, for example. And so you want to find the correct way of interpreting it, which gives you the solution, which is also the thing that you then see in a computer. Right? Um, and so what happened is that in, in some of these equations, you, you have to multiply um, some objects that are not functions. So they are like, you know, so a usual function is something like a graph or a curve or a surface. Um, and so at every point it has a value, which would be sort of the height of the curve or the height of the surface. Now, of course, you have two of them, you can multiply them because you just multiply the two values. And in some of these stochastic partial differential equations, uh, what happens is that you end up with situations that are so rough that in some sense they, they oscillate infinitely high and infinitely fast everywhere. And so you cannot really just, it doesn't really have a value at a point anymore, right? So you can, you can form averages, but you cannot look at the value at a point. And so then it's not clear what it means to multiply these things. And so you can write down some equation, but it has a product in it, and you don't know what the product means. Um, and so what I did was to build a theory that somehow gives a consistent interpretation to these kind of equations and you know, allows you to build some solution theories for these equations. Could you tell us about your way of working or thinking alone in number? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, both. So actually many of the, so for example, this work, I, I wrote it completely alone. Um, so that was just single author work and I have a number of works like this. But then I also like to work in collaboration with people. Uh, so I do have, currently I have a number of postdocs and PhD students at Warwick and so I work in collaboration with them. And then of course I also have collaborators in you know, many places, like also in Marseille, for example. Oui, Etienne Cardou. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes, I mean, I, I enjoy both. I mean, I, I, so I would, I don't think I would be able, you know, to, to work in complete isolation for five years or so, uh, and then suddenly just come back with something. So that's not, somehow not the way I work. <laughs> Besides being a mathematician, you are a computer programmer and a company director. <laughs> You've developed Amadeo software through powerful wave and audio editors. According to you, which are the, the connection between math and industry? So there isn't that much of a link with that specific software and mathematics, but there's a general link between the process of writing software uh, and the process of writing an article uh, in mathematics. So this is actually, the, um, the way you think is actually quite similar. Oh, really? And in particular, especially if you write software library. So for example, some, right, so some software that can then be used by other software developers, right? So if you write a graphics library, for example, um, then you have to separate the part of the graphics library which the other programmers will see and use, right? So you say, okay, there will be these and these functions. There's a function for drawing a circle and a function for drawing a square and whatever. Um, and then you have to actually program these functions. And that's very similar to the way when you write an article in mathematics, you have to decide uh, what will be the statements of the theorem. So what are the results that you want to, you know, put in, put forward and you want people to see and sort of, you know, what do you put into the theorems and then, you know, how do you structure the proof? And the sort of structuring a proof is very similar how you would also structure a software library where you would have somehow lower la layers and higher layers and you have to think a little bit about what makes use of what. Um, so it's, so in that sense, there's, a, there's actually a very strong similarity in the way things are structured and the way you think about it. Could you describe this software? Oh, uh, that's, well, it's an audio editor, so you can, uh, you know, you can use, well, you can make sound recordings with it and you can apply different effects. You can, 
analyze the sounds. You can you know, transform from one sound format to another one and save in different formats and uh, these kind of things. I mean, so for example, there are some you know, small recording studios that use it. Um, people use it. There are some video games companies that use it because it has a, it has a batch processor. So you can say, for example, I want to apply some effect, say some graphic equalizer or something to a thousand files simultaneously. So then you can just set it up once and then it applies it to a thousand files. And so people use it for this, for example, in, when they produce video games and they have lots of little pieces of sound and they want to do the same with all of them. Um, then, you know, some people just use it for, you know, transferring old vinyl to CDs or just to do recordings for a wedding or for, you know, this kind of thing. So it's, it has quite a lot of uses like that. Yeah. And so, do you think math have a role to play in the development, development of collaborations uh, with the industry? Well, I think math, well, okay, I mean, so a, a big part of modern life is based on math, right? I mean, so if you take, your, you take your phone and, you know, every single function of your phone or many functions in your phone rely on quite advanced mathematics, right? I mean, you have a GPS relies on general relativity. Um, you know, all the graphics relies on, you know, quite sophisticated linear algebra and Fourier analysis and so on. So, so there, there's a, quite a big input and there's even, so it's not, it does not just rely on, you know, 19th century mathematics or somehow early 20th century mathematics. So there's some mathematics like, you know, the, the kind of algorithms that uh, Amazon uses in order to make suggestions of what you might want to buy from them. Uh, these type of algorithms are relatively recent because well, they didn't have much of a use before, right? So that's actually uh, relatively recent mathematics. So there is a, there is an enormous amount of uh, mathematics that is being used by industry. Um, I think, you see, having a knowing mathematics or having a degree in mathematics, I think is also, it's a useful preparation for working you know, in industry, even if it's, you know, you might have learned, you know, some sophisticated theory in your mathematics degree, which you will never apply during, you know, right in your real work. That's perfectly fine. So the point is not so much to directly apply the thing you learned, uh, is to actually gain some flexibility in your thinking. Right? So it's really more about that. So somehow if you, um, as a mathematician in mathematics, you really learn um, to sort of not take things for granted, to somehow, you know, be open about things that are completely different to what you've seen before and then still being able to sort of grasp them relatively quickly and sort of incorporate new ideas and understand them. And it requires certain flexibility. I think that's in some sense more of a, it's a more important aspect if you then go to work in industry than the specific things that you've learned. But that's true, you know, you could have taken any other degree, you're basically never going to use these specific things you learn, right? And so it's, I think essentially there's no point in trying to find very specific things that are directly useful for learning in this industry. It's much more useful to learn how to learn and to be able to then efficiently learn new things and be able to quickly adapt to different situations. Yeah.